This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. Thank you for joining us today. This is Libertarian Counterpoint. We have our co-host Richard Fields on your other side. And in the middle, we have Guy Smith. He's the author of a book, Guns and Control. Guy, can you give us a little breakdown on your book for us? Well, the book is basically a distillation of 20 years of in-depth research into guns, gun control, criminology, gun violence, blah, 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 blah. Uh, anyone who really wants to do the deep dive, you go to gunfacts.info, where we have most of that 20 years of research uh, vaguely well organized. But this book was to try to encapsulate this and put this down into a consumer level everything that we know about the topic and to do it without driving people either to the pro-gun or the anti-gun side, just give them the raw data so that they can make up their own minds. Let me ask you a real quick question. There was a, a raw data book uh, that, that uh, went out, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago called uh, 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 More Crime or More, uh, More Guns, Less Crime. Is, uh, was, was, that, uh, was that on, on point or, or does your data show otherwise? Uh, no, my dad, uh, you know, does not disagree with what John Lott did. And aside from some minor quibbles about confounding variables that he might have included, uh, you know, I don't find anything uh, critically wrong with his book. Um, he has become such a lightning rod. I don't cite it very often. I tend to go one step below in my own personal research. Uh, I tend to lean on people like Gary Kleck, uh, the famous criminologist, and his book, Targeting Guns. But more so than that, I go directly to raw data sources, FBI Uniform Crime Statistics, CDC Gun Violence Data, uh, UN Crime and Drug Control Data, uh, and then try to distill and draw the uh, conclusions from there. One of the big uh, uh, emotional issues when it comes to guns is when we see Las Vegas shootings and other mass shootings, any common sense. What is the uh, result of your research into uh, what laws can or can't do to prevent mass shootings? Uh, the research is not indicating that there's anything that's going to be a great big help. And in fact, the thing that's making mass public shootings more deadly over time has nothing to do with the guns or the magazine capacity or anything like that. It boils down to the fact that the people who want to do mass shootings are studying one another. They're learning from their predecessors. And the biggest variable that we've found so far in determining the body count that can result is not the gun, not the magazine capacity or anything like that. It's what we call the cattle pen scenario. Um, mass shooters who are competition killers who are looking to set the next highest score have discovered that this is facilitated by finding a place that has a lot of people packed in tightly and then either one of the other two variables or both uh, either no or very narrow exits so people cannot flee rapidly or no barriers to hide behind. And here's why this matters. Um, to acquire a target, lay your sights on it, track it while it's moving, and kill that person takes a lot of talent, takes a lot of skill. There's a lot of professional marksmen who cannot do that very well. You get a cattle pen scenario, it takes no talent whatsoever. You just point the gun in the general mass of people, and you keep pulling the trigger, and bodies are going to fall. Yeah, and we talked about, in the green room before the show, we talked a little bit about... Um, magazine capacity and how California, how there's uh, recently was a court ruling that the California's magazine capacity limits were as disallowed, right? Richard, if unconstitutional. I'm not, yeah, unconstitutional. And so essentially what you're trying to, you're saying is these uh, capacity, magazine capacity laws don't really do much is what the data shows. Yeah. In terms of mass public shootings, not at all. What was curious was we decided to plot out, um, mass public shootings based on magazine capacity. And off on the left-hand side of the curve where there's a very small um, body count, there's a you know very predictable bell curve. Well, it just so happened that mass public shootings with 15 round or larger capacity magazines 
also basically fit into that bell curve. There's a series of six mass public shootings that used larger capacity magazines, but those were the outliers. If you took those just off of the chart, 100% of those were um, cattle pen scenarios. Um, except for those exceptional events like Las Vegas, Pulse Nightclub, uh, we include Sandy Hook on there and Virginia Tech as well. You take those out and the magazine capacity fits into the same bell curve as a handgun with under 10 rounds. So, so that's the, the fear of people have is that it, it feels for people that it's scary. It's kind of makes a logical sense. Well, if a gun can hold more people, more bullets, then more people will die, but it's just not really showing to be the case statistically. Mathematically, it's not showing any consistency at all. I forget the regression number that we ran, but it was ridiculously low. You uh, you mentioned the uh, competition among mass killers to have the next highest uh, body count. And uh, that's obviously got to be an unbalanced and mentally ill in some way or another person. Uh, has the, uh, going back to the Reagan era, when uh, mental health hospitals were uh, disgorged their patients and sent them into halfway houses or onto the street for outpatient uh, uh, health. Has that, uh, is there a, a strong correlation between that phenomena and uh, mass killings? Uh, the answer to that is both yes and no. Um, in the book, we do look at deinstitutionalization and we draw the decline in beds versus the increase in mass public shootings. But what we have to understand is that mass public shootings in terms of frequency is going up worldwide. And even though in Western countries, modern economies, there was deinstitutionalization, in third world countries where you also see mass public shootings, there generally wasn't. They were basically deinstitutionalized to begin with, except for their extreme cases. But once we get past Columbine, which was the mass public shooting that changed everything, uh, we see a tight correlation between two different things. Some bit with deinstitutionalization. But we went to an FDI website where they report adverse reactions to medications, and we took the top 35 psychotropic prescription medications, and we plotted that against the increase in both population-adjusted increase in both mass public shootings and number of people killed in mass public shootings, and the correlation uh, was well above 0.7. So there's uh, a very disturbing thing there. I think it requires a lot more research. But if one thing that we know about deinstitutionalization is that they decided to go down that route and close beds in psychiatric hospitals because they knew there was this new uh, variety of medications that could be given to patients and allow them to try to function normally in public, which the psychologists and psychiatrists thought was probably a better recovery path. Well, what we know about people with mental illness is that they're not terribly reliable. And so having them manage their own medications um, might be a mistake. So you get someone who's on the edge, they do a cold turkey withdrawal without talking to anyone of a medication, uh, they end up having uh, psychotic reactions to it, um, uh, and they then go um, act on some fears and some hatreds that they've been nurturing for years. Yeah, this interesting with mental health is interesting because I have an anxiety disorder, and for years they tried to treat me as for depression. And, and the, the wrong medication really made my life awful. And so I, the, able, the ability to get off the depression medication and just start treating my anxiety disorder just with therapy, just, you know, for the most part, conversational therapy was, was huge. And my partner, she's uh, bipolar. And I know every now and again, we have to switch medications and it can be a year and a half process. And if someone does not have a strong support group, that process could really send someone down a, a mental rabbit hole that's very difficult to get out of. And I think we're not, we really don't discuss mental health in this country very well. And I think that's, when we talk about gun violence, that's really the area where if we want to make a difference, that's the area where we have to spend some time. I don't know what the, I don't know what the numbers are, but I'm going to guess that there are probably more, correct me if I'm wrong, are there more uh, police killings of civilians than civilians killing of each other or, uh, or not? 
Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, legal interventions, at least with firearms among police, I forget the exact number, but it's uh, somewhere down, I think, in the 400 range uh, annually. And the number of people committing homicides with firearms in the country is, uh, uh, yeah, hovers year to year around 11,000. Okay, so the, the idea of uh, uh, police being uh, entirely and always the bad guys in confrontations is, is not borne out statistically. It's poppycock is what it is. Yeah, well, it's, it's sad. It's because we end up with a lot of police officers having to interact with people who are having severe mental Ill issues. And what are you going to expect them to do? Uh, you're kind of stuck in, this, in this, it's just an awful situation. And you kind of feel for everybody in that because, you know, mental health people and their people who love <clears> you, <throat> you just want them to get home safely. But we also want police to get home safely. You know, everybody deserves to get home safely. And you get these. It's just so disturbing when you get when we have society unwilling to kind of take a step back and take a compassionate look at these kind of disasters that when they happen. It's the compassion part that's a kicker. Uh, there's two states in our country that have had red flag laws long enough that we can actually do some real statistical analysis on them. One of them that had no effect whatsoever on homicides or suicides with firearms. The other state had really no effect on homicides, but their suicide rate was positively, you know, uh, affected by this. The big difference was, and this is Connecticut, the police officer who shows up to take the gun away from the person also gets to do an instant evaluation. And if he thinks the person has either uh, chemical dependency issues or psychiatric issues, they do an immediate referral to the hospital. Now, it's in the book, I forget the exact numbers, but I think one half of the people who they took guns away from got referred to the hospital. And of those people, about 28% got referred for psychiatric or drug and alcohol uh, interdictions. So in effect, the police become an immediate compassionate care person. They're saying, hey, this person obviously needs help. We're going to get them the help that they need. And I think that's one of the reasons that the firearm suicide rate in Connecticut improved. Yeah, all right. So police are actually uh, qualified to be uh, mental health uh, professionals, in, 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 at least in, to a certain extent? Well, they may or may not be qualified, but they get the person in question gets taken to the hospital and it's a couple of hour process. There is maybe some due issue, uh, due process concerns there. But, you know, if a cop has a little bit of training and, you know, they get somebody in and out of the hospital fast enough, that's not, you know, a huge impediment on them if they aren't uh, going crazy or they aren't abusing drugs, um, might not be a huge issue. Do you deal mainly with getting the facts out there so that people can make an honest evaluation of uh, what gun laws or lack of gun laws uh, are advisable? The uh, 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 policy issue that uh, libertarians are quite often interested in is not so much uh, whether or not uh, guns are useful for self-defense, and, and of course they are, or uh, whether they're useful for hunting, which of course they are, uh, but the question of whether guns are uh, helpful to prevent a tyrannical government, uh, as you know, uh, Jefferson famously said, and I think in the Declaration, of, in one of his writings, he said, uh, you know, every once in a while you have to shed a little bit of blood in order to preserve liberty, to prevent a tyrant from overthrowing a country or taking over a country. How do you come down on that, or do you? Well, that's a tough question, uh, and the reason is that it's a two-parter. There's the big constitutional issue, and I'm blessed to be on an invitation-only forum of UCLA Law School where a bunch of bigger brains than mine discuss the Second Amendment and all the related topics. So that was something which I purposefully left out of the book because that is, by its nature, a political issue. And my one goal in this book is not to be political at all. I want people to basically have the raw numbers presented in easily ingestible form and they can make up their own mind. The one thing which I have stumbled across, and it's not a deep field of study of mine, but I did for a short amount of time have some interest in what are the nature of revolutions? How do they work mechanically? And what I've discovered is that around the world, it doesn't take that much 
of an intervention by the people to eventually foment a, a revolution. Um, so in terms of people trying to defend against an American tyrant, uh, it's all perfectly possible. Uh, and the starting cog would, of course, be, you know, to be uh, with arms and to be able to use them in the appropriate manner to, you know, begin the intervention. Yeah. Well, oh, go ahead, Richard. Yeah, you go ahead. Well, I was actually going to go back to the question about writing, um, trying to make this book non-political. How the heck difficult is that in these days to write a non-political gun book? I'm not even entirely sure that's possible. Let's just say it was the wrong year to quit drinking. It just it was <laughs> it, it was a tough one uh, because I'm loaded with opinions and I love spitting them out. But I decided that for this year I was not going to spit out any opinions. Uh, wrong year to you know stop doing that as well. Um, but it is difficult because. Um, Every time that you make a statement, you have to think in terms of how somebody is going to interpret that statement. So when I got up to that point, for example, where I said, you know, it's the cattle pin scenario that's really important. Um, I had a fact checker who helped me with the book and he said, you know, a lot of people are going to say you're trying to divert from the bigger issue. And I had to worry about that quite a bit, but we had to go ahead with it because the data was too compelling. You are, you know, one of your cover, cover blurbs is from Jan Gottlieb with the Second Amendment Foundation. Uh, you had something to do with the, uh, the Heller uh, Second Amendment uh, decision at the U.S. Supreme Court a few years ago. Uh, do you have any uh, people on the uh, uh, anti-gun side of the uh, uh, debate that uh, are uh, paying attention to you? Yeah, they do pay attention to me. Uh, they don't stand up in public and wave a flag for me. But I tell you, my most cherished email that I've ever gotten came from an anti-gunner. And I'll summarize what he said, but he basically said, I was anti-gun before I found the Gun Facts Project. I am still anti-gun. I don't believe a lot of things, but I was saying this about that. And you showed me that using data that I was wrong. And I wanted to say thank you because the last thing I want to do is be wrong in public because if anyone catches me doing that, then they're not going to believe any other opinion I have on this subject. So I, I count that as like one of my greatest victories. No, that is a good victory. Getting people to acknowledge that, hey, I'm wrong. You're not necessarily trying to change anybody's viewpoint. You're just trying to say, here's some facts. And so you can modify your viewpoint or not you, based upon the, the data, the actual cold hard data, rather than the fear that surrounds partial data that we get out in the news media and the politicians who distribute the data that fits their narrative, shall we say. I do it. I'm a politician. I do it myself. It's not, it's, I don't even want to blame them for it. It's just the nature of the beast. But the public has a, you know, you're doing a service to the public to get out the data to, so they can hold people like me accountable. So no, you're not exactly being clear here. And it's, it's getting worse. I want to, I want, you know, this is, since this is kind of not political, I really want to take the research community to task because a lot of them are bought and paid for. A lot of them are biased and they go through their own form of confirmation bias. Um, and one of the things that you'll find on the Gun Facts website, if you look in the right places, is this one page where we have a blow by blow deconstruction of some of the worst of the worst peer reviewed research that we ever find. And the concophony of stupidity or underhandedness, which is going on in the scientific community uh, in terms of evaluating guns and gun policy is horrendous. I mean, it, it, it filters into the propagandist playbook in some elegant and just overtly evil ways. And I don't, I, I wish we lived in a better society where we could say, hey, if it went through a peer review journal you know, then it's got to be credible. But I have now gotten to the point where I don't automatically believe anything by anybody, even if it's been peer reviewed, because the whole peer review process has now become compromised and is unreliable. Yeah. Yeah. The peer review Give process. Give us an example of that, of, of, a, of a peer reviewed uh, uh, <laughs> viewpoint or, or article that, uh, that you've been able to show is totally bunk. 
I don't remember the name of the article. It came out about three months ago, as far as, as I remember. So I downloaded it and I started reading it. And right away, I was a little concerned because they were using synthetic modeling to create crime statistics that never actually existed. That's you know, kind of shady. But all synthetic modeling is built on at least one assumption, usually a whole set. So when I was reading the article, here was assumption number one. It was their anchor point. This was the big thing that they were going to base their synthetic model on. I said, well, I better download that and read that too. That paper had been withdrawn by the author. The only time an author withdraws their paper is when the rest of the scientific community has beaten them so severely for their sloppy data and sloppy methodology that it's a it's a display of shame. It's like saying, sorry, I should have never published that crap. And so that's one of the problems that we're seeing. Not only are people creating crappy research, they're relying on other crappy research to set a foundation for it. You may remember way back in the 1980s, a doctor by the name of Kellerman wrote a paper called uh, Protection or Peril. This was the stupid paper which said that a gun in the home was 43 times more likely to kill somebody living in the home than a stranger. That urban myth is still alive today. And this year I saw a peer reviewed paper that used Kellerman's finding as an indisputable fact in their calculations. And Kellerman's paper once had two separate entries at junkscience.com. That's something of a record. And uh, what are the statistics on uh, whether a gun is uh, uh, more likely to cause uh, uh, death than, than not having one? Uh, that would be too difficult to try to calculate. And the reason is that what constitutes a household and who is allowed in the household is amazingly variable. Uh, let's say that you have a husband and a wife with a revolver in the nightstand. That's one possible household that you have to develop. Uh, evaluate. Let's say you have another one which has two drug-addled dealers in an inner city and they both have nine millimeter automatics. That's an entirely different scenario. So, I, you know, even if I had the money and the time to research that, I probably wouldn't because it's just, it's way too crazy of a thing to try to, uh, you know, draw even a Venn diagram for, much less come up with some sort of statistical reality. Yeah, trying to decide, you know, exactly what constitutes what is in data collection is very hard because, you know, there's no universal agreement. And when it goes back to the uh, peer review process, the modern peer review process isn't the same process that we the peer review process gained its reputation on. It used to be that you would send off your, your paper to a, a couple of people who seriously disagreed with you and a couple people who seriously who agreed with you. And then they'd send back their complaints and you would re-evaluate your paper and then you would come out with a finished product or something close to a finished product. And that's not what happens anymore. Now they write papers to get published in some magazine that call, claims it's being published. And it's all very kind of gross, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> gross may be an understatement. And there's so many ways to rig the peer review process. I mean, if the editor of the journal doesn't like your opinion, he just assigns judges that he knows are going to be antagonistic and they're going to say this paper is not worth publishing. So you may have some quality research, but if the editor just simply doesn't like your conclusions, he'll never see the light of day. Uh, how do how does how do the uh, how do publications get into the uh, this position of uh, judgment that they are able to uh, be you know quote unquote peers that can review and either uh, debunk or uh, applaud somebody's uh, research? How do you get into that position? Oh man, I wish I had the full story on that. I mean, a lot of journals began life in ways that they should have. I'm, the New England Medical Journal, which has fallen into intellectual disrepute uh, in recent years, especially about guns, started off, you know, the way that it should. A bunch of doctors needed a good place to publish where they could get more information, but they needed to set up some judging, you know, so that just cruddy material didn't make it in there. You know, there are a lot of people pushing snake oil and they wanted to feel, filter out the snake oil salesman. Um, but one of the aspects of it is that there are what I call for-profit 
publishing houses. And they are basically places whose only goal is to get submissions and to get them published and make $25 to $50 a pop when you download them. Thankfully, I know some people in academia who have, you know, broad licenses and I go, can you get me that paper? And the next thing I know, it shows up. Um, and that's where we find what I think is one of the weirder things, which is the lack of judging. You may remember it was last year, maybe it was the year before, but some people wanted to prove how disastrous this was. And they wrote a bunch of completely phony academic papers I and they managed, to get, they managed to get six of them published in peer reviewed journals, completely made up from the first paragraph to the last paragraph. And some, some publishers said, sure, we'll print that. Yeah. So what can it, we got about a minute and a half left. What can an average person do when they look at a, at a pub, at a review, a paper to kind of say, okay, is there a way I can judge this to be reasonable? Should I even bother reading it? That's a tough one because these academic papers, reading them is slightly more painful than root canal without anesthesia. Uh, yeah. um, and a lot of people depend on people like me who have the research chops and will take the time and read through there. Problem is there's such a volume and the media reports the headlines without actually digging into the details um, that it's almost impossible. The number one criteria, though, is that if the summary headline sounds really dumb or really weird or really outside of the context that you experience, then the paper itself is probably defective or has been misquoted. What's how do we get your book and uh, and uh, where do we go to get it? Well, the book Guns and Control is out now in digital form. The uh, Dead Tree version is out on the 15th of September, available at Amazon, available at Walmart. I believe it's in Barnes and Noble, but bookstores are dying so fast. I didn't bother to follow up on that one. Uh, and I got my Kindle version. And if you get the ebook version, the charts and the graphs are in full color, which makes it a little bit more fun to read. Any parting words? Yeah, don't believe anybody. Don't even believe me. <laughs> now, that's, that's, that's why I went with raw data in this book presented in a simple form, because if you want to disbelieve numbers from the CDC and the FBI uniform crime statistics, then you've got a bigger problem on your hands. That, there's no better way to end the show than that. Thank you for being on, Mr. Smith. Thank you guys for watching. You can go to libertariancounterpoint.com to get past shows. You can find us on YouTube and all the various social media sites. And thank you, everybody, for watching. From all of us here at Libertarian Counterpoint, please remember to love everybody. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.